I'm fearful uh, because of some chronic health issues that I have and that there's some others in my family uh, also, and I'm fearful of how they're going to play out. So when I was 13, my mom died, and many years of grief and brokenness followed. And I think my one of my biggest fears is that what if that brokenness means I can't be the kind of mom or wife or friend or sister that I need to be? My biggest fear is failure. I think one of my biggest fears is not understanding the true impact that my failed marriage has had on my kids. Uh, not only the pain right now, but um, in the future. But sometimes I'm afraid that God will not come through with His resources or power to enable me to influence others in a positive way. My biggest fear, uh, what causes me the most anxiety, is the fear of failure um, in all aspects of life. I want to fear less and faith more. I want to fear less and faith more. I want to fear less and faith more. What if you could fear less and faith more? Many of us, there's two groups of people in the room. Some of us, like you, you even hear the series title and go, thank you, I need this. And thanks for a lot of people who kind of already said this first that to me. I know there's others. For many of us, living life with fear or anxiety or worry is a very real part of our lives. Then there's another group in the room that is nudging somebody, saying, you need this, this is for you. Because for some of you, like fear isn't a big player in your life. Let me, let me talk to that group for a minute. Here's why this series is important. You need this series because a lot of the people in this room struggle with it, and this will give you great interest, under, uh, insight and understanding into what some of their struggles are. But the other thing is, there will be a time in your life if you would say, man, I'm fearless. Man, I can't even figure out what that looks like. But if you are, there will be something in your life where one day something happens and you go, how do I get out of this? Fear shows up unexpected and unannounced. For those of us that fear is a struggle, it's hard for us even to think, I couldn't be fearless. I can't even imagine what that looks like. You know, I, I've been very honest. Uh, here on uh, multiple occasions sharing that I struggle with worry and anxiety quite often. I've come a long way in that journey, but I've still got a long way to go. This is very much a real struggle for me. So the idea of saying, what if you could be fearless, might seem like a bit much, but what if you could just fear less? In 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt gave one of the most famous inaugural addresses any president has ever given where he had this famous line. It was in the heights of the Great Depression, and it was bad. And he stood up, and he said, the only thing we have to fear is, and he paused, and then he said, fear itself. Fear itself. Do you know what he said next after that? He said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself and clowns. <laughs> True story. True story. I'm just kidding. It's not lost on me that we're starting a series on fear and it, Stephen King's it. Thank you for all the reminders. I get it. I know it's there. Um, I have a fear of clowns and the dentist. I also have a dentist appointment this Wednesday at, at 8.30. So that's not my biggest fears in life, but they're creepy. I'll just get at that. Anyway, no, what he said next. The only thing we have to fear is, is fear itself. Let me read it to you. And he said this. First of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. I think what he says, the way, the way he describes fear there is so important. Nameless, unreasoning, and unjustified terror. And he said the result is it paralyzes and it keeps you from turning retreat and running from your future to advance, moving forward to your future. Now, it's, it's important just to note up front, there's really two types of fear. There's constructive fear and destructive fear. 
Constructive fear builds up. It moves forward. It's, it's good. That's, that's the kind of thing that if you're on the edge of a very tall building and you start being fearful of heights, that's good. Because no one has ever repealed the law of gravity. It's still in play. It hasn't expired. Like, if you step off, you will go down. That's a good thing. If you're walking through an area and all of a sudden you feel like, hey, I should be careful right now. It's dark. Okay, there's a reason there. Sometimes bad things or people lurk in shadows. Be careful. Like, sometimes fear is constructive. It builds you up. It builds guardrails or it builds you up. But there's de destructive fear, which does the opposite. It tears down. Instead of moving you forward, it moves you back. And it either moves you the wrong direction or it gets you stuck. Paralyzes. Well, what if, and we're going to talk about how do you deal with the destructive fear. What I want to do is, if FBR is right, it's nameless. Make sure, let's, today what I want you to do is name it. In your life, if there's something that's causing fear or concern or anxiety, I want you to name it. I'm going to challenge you actually to face it. But I want to give you a very specific way of how you should face that. Because fear really is a reality for many of us. So the question is, what do you do with it? If you have your Bibles, turn to Joshua chapter 1. And I think God actually had a conversation with somebody that if we listened to it, we eavesdropped on what he said to them, there's something in here for you, whether you struggle with fear or not. Because to be honest, this isn't just a, fear, a series about fear. It's about fear and faith. Both. What had happened, let me give you a little background of the story, is the people of Israel had been slaves in Egypt. And God promised to deliver them, and he delivered on the promise by delivering them from Egypt, and he set them free. But he said, I'm going to do one better than that. Not only are you million-plus people going to be free from slavery, I'm going to give you your own land. And their leader was Moses, and Moses... God uses to lead them out, but God is the one that delivered them. Moses was the leader who was the representative between them and God. And as he leads them out, and he says, I'm going to give you this great land. And so he goes up to the land, and they're there, and he says, I'm going to send in 12 spies. The reason he sent 12 is because there were 12 tribes in the nation of Israel, one from every tribe. Great strategic decision because if one person come back, comes back and says, the land is good and we got this, it spreads throughout the nation. So he sends in the 12, tribe, the 12 spies, and they go in, they check out the land, and they come back, and all 12 give a great report. The land is great. It's flowing with milk and honey and free Wi-Fi. It's a good place. We're going to love it here. They brought back samples of the grapes, and they were healthy and good. Everybody agreed. All 12 agreed. 12 out of 12. This land is great. And 12 out of 12 agreed. Problem is, there are some people in there, and they're bigger than us, and they're stronger than us. They all agreed on that. But 10 of them looked at that and said, I know what God said, but they're too big. We can't do this. But two people, a guy named Joshua and a guy named Caleb said, well, yeah, we can't, but God can, and we're with him, so this land is ours. We can do this. Well, the 10, unfortunately, the communication, cascading communication, backfired because these 10 go out and they start telling people, the land's good, but the people are bad. We can't do this. And suddenly, everybody went from saying, hey, we want to go into the land. They, some of them were even saying, let's go back and be slaves again. Some were saying, let's kill Moses. And God said, look, here's the deal. I'm still going to give you the land, but we're going to push pause. As a matter of fact, none of you will enter in except the two that said, this land is good, the people are big, but our God is big. And we believe him, that he'll do what he promised. So for 40 years, they're wandering around the desert with this recalculating, 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 as they kind of are just kind of wandering around until finally, everyone in that generation had passed away. And God said, it's time to go in. Moses dies, the one who led them all this way. And he proved the thing we all know. No leader is irreplaceable. Only God is irreplaceable. And Moses' last day, he hands the baton of leadership to Joshua and says, you're leading now. And God's going to keep his promise. That you're going to get to see this land flowing with milk and honey and free wife. It's going to be great. 
Moses dies. And this is Joshua's first day on the job. God has a conversation with him. Kind of like, you know, you start a new job, you talk with HR. God does his own HR. He kind of talks with Joshua about what he can expect with this job of leading a nation of what is now almost 2 million people. After the death of Moses, this is Joshua 1 verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. And then he describes the land. He kind of gives them the geography of it. From over here to over there, from over here to over there, it's all going to be yours. And then verse 5, he says this. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Because that had to be, you know, in this passage, it never tells us what Joshua's fears are, but they're pretty obvious in this passage. And what it has to be is, what's it like to follow the guy that was the guy? This was Moses' aide, and now he's the leader. And probably people had to say, well, you're no Moses. Or Moses would have done it this way. Or the big pressing question is, God had a special connection with Moses. First appears to him in a burning bush. He works with him to work, deal with the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh in Egypt, and deliver him out. Like he had a very special connection. All these things as he's leading him through the desert. All this is going on. And Joshua had to be asking, is God going to be with me the same way he was with Moses? And God says, just as I was with him, I will be with you. Here's the thing I, I want you to know. Whether you are fearless or fearful, the same God that was with Moses and the same God that was with Joshua is the same God that is with you. The most frequent promise in the Bible is I will be with you. Old Testament, New Testament, time after time, God assures people who are fearful by saying, fear not, I am with you. And for many of us, we don't believe that the same God is with us that was with Moses or Joshua or Paul or Peter. We don't believe that it's the same God or we don't believe he's with us the same way. Because after all, I'm not leading two million people into the promised land. I'm just going to school. I'm just raising kids. I'm just going to work. Never say just when you talk about what you do with your life. I did a whole series on Monday matters. Like what you do matters. And the promise that God makes is not conditional on what your assignment is. God placed you where you are for a reason. He's telling Joshua the thing he would want him, he would want you to know. And anytime you read a promise in the Bible, you have to ask that question. It's a way to study the Bible. Is it a specific promise unique to him, or is it a general promise to all of us? For instance, you know, Noah was told to build an ark. That's a specific thing he was told. You don't need to go build an ark today. That's not, that's specific, it's not general. But when God says, I will be with you, and because it's repeated so often, so many times, to believers and followers of Jesus especially, it's reassured, reassured again and again and again. If you are a follower of Jesus, God's promised, he's with you. So believe him and live that way. And that's what he's telling Joshua as he's facing this big challenge in front of him. He goes on to say this, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Maybe God sits there that Joshua's like, okay, I'll be strong and courageous, but nothing's really registering. Okay, be very courageous. He's pushing on it. Then he gives him very specific instructions. Be careful to obey the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful whenever, wherever you go. There's something important, and it factors into fear, and it factors into faith, that you really do feed your mind the truth of what God says. And he says, do this so it'll go well with you. Not because, and I don't think it's that God's gonna smite you if you miss something. But he's saying, this is how life works. This is how I work. 
Do you trust me to do what I say? And, and there might be, you might say, yeah, I like this part. I don't like this part. Okay, do you trust me? Are you going to follow me? Or are you going to all go off-roading here? Trust me. He goes further and says this. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. There's something important about engaging scripture that God will use to take, to, to diminish fear and build faith and believe it. And then he gives this great promise. For some of you, this needs to be something you think about every day, maybe even more often. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now, those of us that do struggle with anxiety or worry or fear, don't raise your hands, don't answer out loud. How do you feel when someone, you tell someone, man, I'm really worried about something, and they go, oh, well, just don't worry. That's awesome, isn't it? Oh, oh yeah, I forgot. I'll just flip that switch. Because the truth is, for many of us, we've had something happen to us in the past. That makes us prone to anxiety. Some of us have chemical imbalances right now that are fueling some irrational fear. Some of us are probably making choices. We're throwing logs on the, the fire of fear by thinking about things and the what ifs and all that stuff. There's a lot of things it could be. But for many of us, we can't just choose to flip the switch and say, I will fear not. Yet, it's one of the most frequent commands in the Bible. Frequent promise, I'll be with you. A frequent command. Fear not. Some, some people have said that it's in the Bible 366 times it says to fear not. One for every day of the year, one for the year. That would be great if that was true. If that's, I don't think that's true. Like I, I tried to do the math. I'm not good at math. But I tried to do the math. I was like, I can't get that math to work out. You're counting some things that really aren't applicable here. So it's not. But it is in there about 251 times. So if you're in the school year, you know, I like that kind of thing. You know, it's in there a bunch. It's in there throughout. It's in there a lot. And I don't think God would ask you to do something that he knew wasn't possible through his working in your life. 120 times it says, do not be afraid. 131 times it says, do not fear. It's in there a lot. The question is, for those of us who go, please don't tell me just not to worry. How? How do you fear less in faith more? What if you can fear less in faith more? For me, one of the things that helped me is understanding that the answer actually might be found in grammar. Parts of speech. Let me tell you what I mean. I do think faith is the way forward. The problem is many times we think of faith as a noun. It's something you have. And it is. You need to have faith. You need to know what you believe, why you believe it, and what difference will it make in your life. You need to have a faith and build a faith. It is a noun, but it's also a verb. You do need to faith more. It's something that requires action, advance, movement. I will move forward by faith. It is a noun. It's something you have and build. So you need to be having it. You need to be building it, but if you just have it and it doesn't affect your day-to-day -day decisions, you will be paralyzed. You will retreat. You'll know some things, but you won't experience God showing up as you move forward. What if the things, same is true of fear? Because that's what, where I got stuck when people would say, just don't fear. I would think that, well, it's something I have. I cannot deny that right now I am experiencing anxiety. I wish I wasn't. I wish I could flip the switch. I would choose to do something different if I could. I can't. And just say not to do it. I, I, there's no break. There's no on-off switch. There's, I don't know what to do. There's nothing to unplug. It is a noun. It's something that's a very real experience. And some of you need to know what you're experiencing. It, yes, it really is something you're experiencing. That others won't quite understand exactly, but yes, it's something you're feeling and experiencing. That's the noun, but there is 
a verb side of this that I have to take responsibility for in my life of saying, it's something I have and I'm experiencing fear, but I'm not going to make the choice to live that way. It won't just be something I have. I need to choose it's not going to be something I do and I practice. And I actively fear by what I do. You know one of the things that scares some of you? It's safe. It's the fear of the, the what ifs. And so safety becomes so valuable to us. We get paralyzed trying to make our life safer and do levels of insulation and make it okay. That's so much so that safety can become our God that we worship. Or it can play the role of God, the thing we count on to keep us safe. That's why some of us would say, I don't fear, is because you've arranged a life that's insulated from people, it's insulated from risk, from stepping out. Just because you don't fear doesn't mean you're living by faith. Fear is a choice you can make, and so is faith. There is a verb, and I want you to start thinking of faith and fear as verbs. Something you should do by faith, faith, faithing. Let's turn from a noun to a verb, but so is fear. But don't do this. Make the choice. I'm not going to make decisions based on fear. It's still easier said than done for many of us. But I want to challenge you to turn it into a verb. Action is required. And what it means is you trust God to take the steps that he calls you to take to live the way he calls you to live and trust that he will be there along the way. Because here's the truth that I want you to know. Strength and courage develop by the choices we make more than the feelings we have. And for those of us that struggle with fear, we need to know that as we are making choices either to fear or to faith, something is being built in our lives. Make it constructive. Let it be something building your faith and building your trust that God really does show up God really does come through, just like he promises, that he promises to be with you. Feed your faith. Don't feed your fear. Because much like a stray animal, if you feed your fear, it will not go away easily. Beware of what you're feeding your mind and what you're surrounding yourself with, but also the choices you make will develop your, your faith and your courage and your strength. Because fear isn't what God produces in us. He leads us from it, but sometimes that means he leads us through it. Sometimes you have to actually identify it, name it, and face it. Paul told the guy he was mentoring, Timothy, this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. That's not what God gives us. If you fear that or feel that, that's not coming from him. This is what he's trying to build, construct, constructive in your life. Power, love, and self-discipline. What if you could live by faith, relying on God's power, his love, and his self-discipline that shows up and that starts becoming your experience? You know where you, that starts to be true? When you trust him and rely on him to do that and you move forward. If you retreat or get paralyzed and get stuck, this is waiting just down the road. And I can speak that from experience. What if you really could fear less and faith more. Fast forward in Joshua's story, and he this time he only sends in two spies and very careful, like who he sends. And he goes, he goes, just check out the land so we know what we're dealing with. This time they come back and go, yeah, still no kind of free Wi-Fi, all that's still good. But there's big people; they may even gotten bigger. The fortified city, there's one just down the road, Jericho. Like we're gonna have to face that pretty quick. And he's like, okay, God's promise is still true. God's still bigger. Tell him when to get ready to go. And they move across the Jordan River, and they get in there, and they're approaching the city of Jericho, which was heavily fortified, a wall 25 feet high, as much as 20 feet thick in spots, heavily armed. They were going to be a tough opponent. And so God gives them a battle plan that was very unique. He said, I want you to take the army and put the Ark of the Covenant where we keep the Ten Commandments. And it's our kind of personification of God right there with us. And, and I want you to do that. I want you to go out every day for six days, march once around the city. God tells him this. Don't say anything. But just march the army around. Okay. Six days. And on the seventh time, I want you to walk around seven times. And on the seventh time, don't have it. And no one makes a noise until I say so. But then when I say so, blow the trumpets and everybody yell. All right. If you went to a high school football game Friday night, 
The coach is not asking the band director to get the trumpets out to blow those instead of passing the ball. That's a weird strategy for anything, but alone a bow. Josh says, okay, I trust you. Now this makes sense, but you make sense to me that I can trust you. I know that, so I will trust you. And he does it. Walk, they walk around one time, one day, another time, the next day, six days, the seventh day, go around seven times. And he says, now shout, shout, a little bit louder now, a little bit louder now. He's having to shout. He's like, have him shout, blow the trumpets, and all of a sudden, the walls come crashing down. And we definitely focus on what happens when the walls crash down. But I think of it in terms of my mind. Joshua has me walk around going, what are we doing? Hello, Jericho. Yeah, we're just, hello. You know, just, man, what are we doing here? And think about this. For seven days, he and everybody else had to stare at what had to be something that was probably something pretty fearful. They just had to look at it. Walk around it. Yeah, that is very fortified. Yeah, they are very strong. I think God did that for a reason. I want you guys to fully understand how big this is so you can fully understand how big I am. For seven days, he had to face his fear. For some of you, We've been using white noise or distraction. We've been looking at, trying to look at other things or have been trying to build up our own resources. Instead of just staring at the thing we fear, naming it and saying, God, I'm fearful of this. I need your help. What is the way forward for me? Today, I want, to name, I want you to name it, and I want to challenge you to face it, if fear is something that's real for you. I want to ask the band to come up. They're going to play a song that I think could be a great song because for many of us, the jump from fear to faith, it seems pretty wide. I'm not sure if I can jump that far yet. Maybe I can fear less. I'm, I'm open to that, but I'm not even sure that's easy. Well, I think the thing that connects the dots is hope. Do you have hope that God really could be the same God that talked to Joshua, be the same God that wants to be with you? And that he really is bigger than whatever you're facing. And what I want to ask you to do is to name it. And ask what you're fearing right now. Is it constructive? If so, what's it building in your life? Or is it destructive? What is it tearing down? What's growing in your life that shouldn't be there in terms of this destructive fear? How is it holding you back? How is it getting you stuck? Name it. And then I want you to figure out, and I think this is such an important deal. You've got to name what it would look like for you in your situation to faith more. To turn faith from a, a noun, something you have and build, but put it into action. What would it look like for you to live by faith and actively trust God? And maybe you need to ask God for wisdom or insight. And for that one group that I talked about at the beginning that, you know, fear isn't your deal, that's great. But faith is. And it's possible not to be fearful and live an insulated life. Where do you need to faith more and trust God? And then once you've figured that out, I want to encourage you to fight by faith. Fight fear with faith because the way out is forward. Paul told us in 2 Corinthians to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Some of us, what's going on up here is fueling our faith. It's destructive. Take those thoughts captive. Don't let them run free. Fill your mind with truth and surround yourself with people where you can be honest and authentic about what's really going on in your life and ask them to fight with you and to help fight for you. Don't face it alone. Face it by faith, with faith, with others, and with God because the same God that was with Joshua is the same God that's with you. Joshua 1.9. This is the promise he makes not just to Joshua, to all of us. He's commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord God will be with you wherever you go. That promise is just as true for you as it was to the hundreds and hundreds of people that it made to throughout the history. Because God is telling a story that he can be trusted and he is bigger than whatever we fear. 
As we listen to this song, I want you to think about where might you fear currently, where you can fear less? And what would it look like for you to faith more? Figure out what it would look like practically, even in the next 24 hours. And ask God for wisdom. How do I move forward? How do I have this hope in the midst of where I'm going through currently? Listen to this. As I walk this great unknown, questions come and questions go. Was the purpose for the pain? Did I cry these tears in vain? having its way and it's out of control and it's, it's challenging. For some of you, it's just, it's more occasional. It's not seasons or lifetime. It's just seasonal. For some of you, you're not there. Wherever you are with this, I want to pray for you right now that God would give you the courage to move forward by faith, that he'd surround you with people that you could be honest with, and that you can figure out for you what it looks like to fear less and faith more. Let's pray today. Heavenly Father, for those that the struggle is real right now and they're really struggling, I pray that you'd let them know they're not alone. Because I know at least one other person that this struggle is real. It's me. God, thanks that you've promised to be with us, whether flood, fire, or whatever we're going through. You've promised your presence. And that's our hope. 
And because we put our hope in that and our trust in that, we move forward to the story that you're writing in our lives. Not that we're writing and submitting to you for approval. The story that you're writing for our life. It's a good story. And it's a God story. And you are right in the middle of it. God, I pray you would build our faith. And help us to fear less and faith more. 